Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Activist Lawyer Podcast. Now, I am delighted to be joined by Her Honour Wendy Joseph Casey, who was, of course, a judge at the Old Bailey, sitting on criminal cases, trying mainly allegations of murder and other homicide. Wendy joins us today to talk about her book, her new book, Rough Justice, Have We Got the Law We Deserve? And I've read the book and it's absolutely fascinating, a really great read. So I'm delighted that we get to talk about Wendy's career, um, you know, since she was called to the bar by Grayson in 1975, a really fascinating journey and also her new book which we get into some of the details of the book and how it came about. So I hope you enjoy today's recording. And yes, remember to like, follow, share and review. Thank you very much for joining me, Wendy. Pleasure. Okay, well, we'll get started. We're going to talk about, I suppose, your career and journey in law and also your new your new book, which has recently been published. But first, to bring us back in time a little bit, I'm interested in knowing what inspired you to get into law. It's not a story I'm very proud of, Sarah, because I wasn't exactly inspired to get into it at all. Um, What had happened was I was reading English at university. Uh, I'd always wanted to be a writer since I was, well, since I learned to read. Uh, And it wasn't until the end of my second year at university. uh, My mum, my dad, having then been dead for a long time, said to me, Darling, um, it's all very well wanting to be a writer, but how exactly are you going to earn a living? And uh, she had a point, and I had a boyfriend who was um, changing from his degree, which was history, to law, and it seemed a convenient thing to do to uh, to change to law as well. I sometimes think what would have happened if he'd been changing to something like <laughs> land management in Turkestan. Wow. Uh, but anyway, I changed to law and um, went off to read for the bar. Uh, as a matter of fact, he didn't. Uh, and um, so I got into it and it wasn't until I discovered how fascinating the job was that I really decided I would stick with it and, and be and be a lawyer. Fantastic. And you were called to the bar by Grayson in 1975, later in 2012, becoming only the third ever full-time female judge at the Old Bailey. How do you think things have changed for women lawyers since you were first called to the bar? Well, as you said, I was called in 1975, um, so pretty long in the tooth now. And it was a different world then. Um, It was a very middle-class, male-dominated. There were a few successful women barristers, but there were very few. I mean, the first woman was called to the bar in 1921, I think, or perhaps 22. So we haven't had women around for the centuries that the men have been around. And um, the first women QCs weren't until I think the 30s and the first circuit judges um, and the more senior judges didn't sort of reach us, us women, um, until pretty much the 60s. So when I came to the bar in 75, we were a bit of a rare breed and we weren't taken very seriously. There were the few who'd succeeded, but... We weren't treated badly. We just weren't taken seriously. Um, Things could not have changed more in the years since. Now, more women are called to the bar than men, marginally. But still, there it is. That isn't to say we have an easy time of it, because um, the reality is that although women have brilliant careers until their late 30s, very often they then hemorrhage away from the bar in order to have families. And it's not easy to come back. It's an unforgiving profession. But of course, the bench, the judiciary, is drawn from the senior lawyers and principally, even now, from the senior end of the bar. So if you don't get people up to the senior end of the bar, you don't get them onto the bench. Mm -hmm. 
which is a problem. Um, we do have a really good representative body of women now on the bench. Uh, I think that um, in some areas, such as tribunals, they are extremely well represented. Even on the circuit bench, there is, I think, over 30% of the circuit bench is now female. But I'm particularly proud of the Old Bailey. And it's only one court, mm -hmm. but it is the Central Criminal Court. And when I was appointed to sit there in 2012, I was the only woman sitting there amongst all those men. Yeah. And there were 16 full-time judges, 15 men and me. And when I left 10 years later, almost exactly 10 years later, uh, half the bench at the Old Bailey were female. And now there are more women than men. Great. So um, I think that's a success story and it's Absolutely. something I'm hugely proud of. That's fantastic. Well, congratulations on your new book, Rough Justice, the full title, Have We Got the Law We Deserve? It really is a fascinating read for all sorts of reasons. We look into some of them today. But of course, this isn't your first book, as you are indeed already a best-selling author. I'm interested in learning about maybe how you became an author, what led you to write books and um, that centre primarily around the, the criminal justice system. And secondly, what inspired you to write your, your latest publication, Rough Justice? at this time um so sarah uh, i i seem to be saying the same thing again it all sort of happened by accident rather <laughs> like the way i got into the law at all but you know that's life you walk around corners opportunities present themselves and you either walk towards them or or you don't um so the reason i wrote that book um unlawful killings was as I suppose the reason people wrote many books, was lockdown. Mm -hmm. I had been for many years a thing called a diversity and community relations judge. It's a separate appointment from the day job, and it involved really what it says on the tin. So I was uh, liaising with talking to all sorts of people from the community, people who felt they weren't understood by the law or that the law needed to know more about them, or who just wanted to know more about the law. So students, um, school children, but also uh, groups that felt um, marginalized, I think. So I did work with imams and with the, with the mentally ill. So lots and lots of different groups. Well, when COVID came along, um, we didn't close the Old Bailey. We always kept at least one court going and then two. But in those early months, a lot of us were told to go away and not come back until the autumn. And on the 20th of March, I was told to go away and not come back till the beginning of August. And I was really concerned about the school kids whom I would normally have had into the courtroom at the end of the day, sitting with me in maybe court one at the Old Bailey, showing them what everything was there, letting them have a go at pretending to be the judge or the defendants or the witnesses, forming a jury, um, you know, we just have a couple of hours together. Well, of course, I couldn't do that in lockdown. Mm -hmm. And they weren't doing anything, bless them. Most of them were at home. Um, many of them in the in inner London would have been stuck in flats. And I was very concerned about it. So I wrote what was meant to be a little pamphlet, which turned out to be one of the early parts of Unlawful Killings. Wow. But originally it was just meant to be a pamphlet that explained and drew the picture of what would happen if a school brought their kids in to me in the, in the evening at the Old Bailey. And I sent it off to a literary agent and I, I said, Alice, is there any chance that we could publish this and send it out to the schools? And she said, Wendy, no. Um, but if you can write more like this and really show what it's like inside the courtroom, I can find you publishers for it. And she was as good as her word. So over that summer, I wrote um, most of the stories, not all of them, but most of them. And in due course, I finished it off. 
And she did exactly what she said she would do and found publishers for it. And no one could have been more surprised than me <laughs> um, when it, it, it began to sell. Because yeah. you sort of think it's a bit of a niche thing mm -hmm. um, and that not that many people would be interested. But it's not about the law. It, it's about people yeah. and what happens to them in the courtroom. Absolutely. And I really noticed that with your with um, Rough Justice as well. There are also wonderful historical references throughout the book that really bring us back to the old Bailey of days gone by. And as readers, I think, you know, we ask ourselves what has really changed when it comes to the law and justice. And indeed, thankfully, a lot has changed, which is good news. And, you know, but we're brought on this journey to explore, you know, the administra administration of justice in relation, I think, to specific groups like, for example, women and girls girls really form a central part of your the narratives that you use to explain instances within your book. This is quite a broad question and it really kind of relates back to the first one. But do you think enough has changed when it comes to women and the law, of course, bearing in mind the differences between, you know, defendants and victims, of course? Yeah, um, it depends what you mean uh, by enough. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is true that I have focused upon four little stories that have got um, a woman or a girl at the centre of them, either in the witness box or in the dock or in the jury box yes. or in counsel's row. But I don't want to make it sound like, you know, this is only for women. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I re there's lots of men in there, too. And I'm really focusing upon people who have a difficult time in accessing justice. Yes. And one of the things that astonished me um, is how much has changed and at the same time how little has changed for groups that are particularly vulnerable. So if I take as an example, the first story that I've written has got a, a child of 12 in the witness box trying to give her evidence about having been raped by an older man, a, a friend of the family. Mm -hmm. So a familiar situation to anyone who sits in the courtrooms. Now, the reality is that we have done so much in terms of changing the procedure to try to make it easier for um, people like her, vulnerable people, to give their evidence and be heard, to have a voice. So um, we started off with allowing them to give their evidence from behind a screen so that the jury and the barrister and judge could see them, but not the public gallery and certainly not anyone in the dock. Then we allowed them to give that evidence from outside the courtroom, being joined by a video link. Then we allowed them to give their evidence in chief, that is, their account of what happened, um, at a much earlier stage, and it would be pre-recorded uh, and then played to the jury. Now we allow them to not only give their evidence in chief at an earlier stage, when things are fresh in their memory, but to be cross-examined and have that pre-recorded as well. Yeah. So... Um, those are examples, only some examples of the many, many things that have been done to make it easier for people to give their evidence in advance. Things have been done to make it easier for vulnerable defendants, mm -hmm. too. So one would expect the whole thing to be much a much easier process for them. There have also been brought in strict limitations on the way in which they can be cross-examined. So they can't, barristers aren't allowed to explore uh, a witness's previous sexual history without leave of the judge, and it ain't easy to get the judge's leave to do that. So many, many things have changed. And I think that once a case gets into the courtroom, in fact, Although it is far from an easy experience, we have given a voice to the vulnerable. And that is reflected by the conviction rates once a case gets into the courtroom. But all of your listeners will know that the rate of people who are in fact the victims, in truth, 
the victims of sexual assaults who actually end up with the perpetrator being convicted is tiny. Mm. And that is really because things go wrong long before people get into the courtroom. And that is because the process is really difficult. Uh, And so women or girls don't complain or they don't complain early. And so by the time they do complain, allegations are made against them of having invented it Mm -hmm. or they fall victim to pressure because the person who has um, attacked them is someone with whom they are in a relationship or to whom they are close or they are close to someone close to the perpetrator so pressure is brought to bear on them or um, it is the father of their children and they don't want to drag their children through all of that or the process is just so long and so convoluted that they lose heart Mm -hmm. or they're asked to disclose things about themselves that they just don't want to disclose. Uh, And so um, it remains a very problematic thing. The good news is that when a case gets into court, there is in fact a comparatively high rate of conviction now. So that's good. Yeah. um, We're making some progress. We're making some progress. Still more to be done. Well, I think that the book provides um, both a practical analysis and a reflection of real life court scenarios, which I was really interested in seeing. And the scene is really set beautifully. We get some important insights, of course, into practice and procedure. Um, for example, I was pleased to read a note that show, you know, showing what a judge sitting on a sexual offence case might say to a jury with regards to making assumptions about the victim, for example. Yeah. Um, but my question is, was it difficult to achieve, I suppose, a sense of balance and trying to to get the message or the theme of the book across um, and being true and realistic to the actual court setting while also being sensitive to some of the cases, you know, that were before you as a judge in the Old Bailey because they were very, very difficult and very complex cases. Yeah. Um, it is easy to get, it is easy to get distracted um, and to try to, to be too polemical. So, um, One of the things I did, because I didn't want to simply say, oh, poor victims, Mm -hmm. Um, because after all, not every not every witness is telling the truth. Some are not. Um, I think in sexual offences, the vast majority are, but not everyone is. And, and, And that is very obvious sometimes. So what I've done is not only to concentrate on um. So there are four stories. I haven't only concentrated on women in the witness box. I've also looked at women who end up in the dock. And women in the dock can be particularly vulnerable. Uh, So I've tried to sort of give a a broader picture, looking right around the courtroom um, as to the problems that arise. Uh, People always say, well, you know, how, 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 how difficult is it to get a sense of balance? And I think as a barrister, it probably isn't very easy because you are brought into the case on one side or another. And all your training is about advocacy. Yeah. And advocacy is the art of oral persuasion. It's about making people listen to you and take on board what you're saying and hopefully being persuaded by what you say. And so every advocate, every barrister, every solicitor who comes into the courtroom comes in with a particular standpoint. The judge is the one person in that courtroom who isn't there with a preconceived point to to argue. Uh, And so the job is about being balanced. The job is about giving, um, the job is about having a fair trial, because if there isn't a fair trial, it's no point in having a trial at all. Of course. But it involves fairness to every party who is involved. And so 
as you learn more about being a judge and you get trained to be a judge, the sense of balance is sort of instilled in you. And you, you just absorb the skill of being able to look at the whole picture mm-hmm. and try to put it together in particular put it together for the jury absolutely and i mean i didn't realize until i read the book the extent of people management the responsibility of a judge to manage literally every aspect in order to achieve the aim which is of course to make sure that the defendant or the the charge person charged has a fair trial ultimately the decision rests with the jury but i was really astounded to see and you really give really great insights into how you you manage the different personalities but because of course there's so many before you even leave your chambers to go into court that day you're already ready managing the situation so that was a really a real pleasure to see what that was like and I mean people say the saying goes you could write a book and I'm, I'm glad you did which features a lot of these personalities um, but I suppose it leads on from your last question in terms of the particular skills that a judge might have people management they're really ensuring that there's a fair trial but do you think it is important to have a level of compassion and maybe I'm not really saying that in respect of a defendant or a victim but in light of managing the situation going forward because in your book there's um, instances of you know even the jury presenting with a sickness um, you know unexpected matters arise pretty much every day it would seem in most trials so is compassion an important quality to have? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of interesting, isn't it, to to, to use that word um, to a lawyer, because people think of the law as being um, pretty dry. Mm-hmm. And actually, it is. If I'm honest, I don't think the law is that interesting. What is fascinating are the people. And of course, of course a judge has to be a reasonably good lawyer. Uh, and either know the law or at least know where to look it up and how to apply it. But the the real skills and the thing that makes um, the courtroom endlessly interesting is people only end up in the courtroom, certainly in the witness box or in the dock, um, when they are at a critical point in their lives. And for the families and friends of those either in the witness box or in the dock, they have a vested interest that touches their lives as well. And so you're dealing with people who are very often in crisis. And at the Old Bailey, because we're not dealing much there, you know, with sort of um, shoplifting and so forth, we are dealing with the serious end of the market. Not that I want to downplay the gravity of any crime, but um, we're essentially... Almost everything I dealt with there had a dead or a nearly dead body in it. And so you can um, appreciate how the ante gets upped and the atmosphere in the courtroom is really, really grim sometimes, um, but always fascinating because you are looking at the mess that people can get themselves into and how it's happened. And it's the how it's happened that's so interesting. And that's where um, the word compassion sort of comes in. Because there are bad people. There are, you know, people who drop down out of a clear blue sky and they are just wrong But there, there aren't too many of those. By and large, people, it, it's not that they're bad people. It's that they do bad things things, sometimes wicked things. And it's how they've got there, how they've ended up in that position. And so often it has to do with the way they've grown up, the people around them, the life opportunities they've been given or not given. And that is true not just of the people in the dock, Mm-hmm. It's true of those who give the evidence yes. as well. So um, it's an entire world that you're dealing with in every single case. And I, I've heard that word compassion a lot. Um, 
I, it's not my favorite word, and I've heard the word sympathy a lot, mm -hmm. and that I think is the wrong word. The word I think that best describes what a judge needs is empathy. You need to be able to not pat people on the back and say, oh, you poor thing, you know, yes. let, me, let me see <laughs> what the lowest sentences I can give you. But you need to empathize with how each person is feeling in that courtroom in, it, in order to be able to deal with the different situations that arise. So when a, a hysterical mum up in the public gallery is about to throw herself over the balcony because her son's about to be convicted of murder or because she's listening to her daughter describing some awful thing that's happened to her, it's the judge's job to see that coming yes. and to calm it down, to make sure that there's proper people up there to deal with it, to make sure that proper breaks are given, to make sure that people understand that the law is there for them. Absolutely. And that's the difference between a criminal court and a civil court. In a, in a criminal court, the court belongs to you, to me, to every one of us within our community. That's what it's there for. Absolutely. Well, the book itself, I mean, it's thoroughly entertaining, despite the fact that obviously the content um, is dealing with serious and often violent crime. And this seems like maybe a trivial question, but I'm just wondering, um, while you sat in the Old Bailey, how did you switch off from some of the cases because reading through them they're so complex you didn't know what to expect um, the next day in many of the cases and you're trying to balance all of these personalities as well in order to ensure that you know you do your job and and there is a fair trial was it difficult to park your work and focus on other things or was it very much all-consuming um it demands a lot of hours the court sits from, oh, I don't know, 10.15 to 4.15, and it doesn't sound like a long working day. But all the work is done outside those hours. And not that we're not working in court, we obviously are, but um, all the preparation is done before or after or at weekends. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, it, it's absorbing in the sheer terms of the hours of work. Um, but as to switching off from the content of it, um, I suppose the thing to say is that most of us on the bench have come from the bar. And when you're at the bar, you're either prosecuting or you're defending. Either way, you are much more hands-on, much closer to the blood and semen than you are on the bench. If you're defending, you will be sitting every day in the tiny little cell, taking instructions from your defendant. If you're prosecuting, you'll be dealing with the um, with the witnesses whom you're calling that day, uh, with the family of the victims, with the police officers who have been deeply involved in getting it that far. Uh, you know, so, so you're much more hands on, yeah. and if you can't cope with that you're not going to stay in the job because you, 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 you just wouldn't cope. So I think by the time you get to be a judge, you haven't, I've used the expression before, you haven't dropped down out of a clear blue sky. You've got all of that behind you. And then being a judge, you are removed from it. I mean, you are in a different place when you're a judge. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, Sarah, but um, in a courtroom, everybody is facing the judge. And the judge is the only person sitting there able to see everything that's going on, facing the other way. You are separated, separated from it all by that thing called the bench mm -hmm. behind which you are sitting. And you are actually physically sitting again, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, at a different level. In almost all of our courtrooms, the judge's bench is higher than the level at which the jury is sitting or the level at which barristers sit, the own, uh, and, certain, and the level of the witness box. The only other structure in the courtroom which is at the same height as the judge's bench 
is the dog. Mm -hmm. And that's not by accident. The proper design for a courtroom, not all of them have it, but the proper design is for the judge and the defendants to be facing each other across the courtroom at the same level. And that's um, oh. part of the system. So uh, the answer to your question is one isn't quite so um, deep down and in the nitty gritty that it's impossible to switch off. Uh, and uh, judges do. You, you just do because otherwise you couldn't do the job. We all have the sort of particular sort of case we hate. I always really hated baby murders. Yeah. But, you know, by and large, we get through it. And the fellowship of, your, of, of, of the other judges, it's a really good support system. Excellent. Excellent. Um, well, finally, I suppose a lot of our listeners to this podcast are graduates and perhaps aspiring judges. And I'm wondering, what would your advice be or would you have any advice for anybody contemplating a career in the law, one such as yours, and perhaps, yeah, more so a career as a judge? If you were thinking of being a lawyer, um, there are a lot of major decisions to be made. Um one is the sort of law that you want to do. So there's millions of different, well, hundreds of different sorts of law that you could do. And as you can imagine, if you, if you sort of went into patents or shipping um, or drainage, it's pretty different from going into family law or criminal law. So you need to look at the area that, that interests you. The second decision is whether you want to um, be in the courtroom or at a desk, particularly if you are doing something like crime, you need to decide whether you want to be the advocate in court, in which case, although you can do that as a solicitor, your first choice would probably be to at least look at the bar, or whether you're more interested in the preparation, putting it all together, in which case you might prefer to be a solicitor. Um, so, so those are big decisions to be made. If you do decide that you want to go into it and you haven't actually um, looked at it more closely, the thing then to do is to try to get what is called a mini pupillage in a set of chambers, uh, a week maybe or two weeks over the summer, following a barrister around in whatever discipline he or she is, is, is doing, looking at their cases, and that gives you a feel for the thing. Um, as far as being a judge is concerned, I don't know if your listeners will realise this, I guess some will, but you can't become a judge as a first career. You can't be, you can't get a qualification called Judge BA. Um, you can't go to college to study to be a judge. Mm -hmm. You can in other countries. Right, you can yeah. do it, for example, in France, uh -huh. but our system doesn't allow that. Our system requires that in order to become a judge, you must have proved yourself um, in another area of the law, usually the bar. So most people who sit as criminal judges will have practiced as criminal barristers. I did for 32 years. Ten of those years as a silk. I was a QC, now a KC. Um and then became a judge after that. So um, although judges are getting younger and younger now, mm -hmm. you still do need a, another career in the law first. And the classic way of doing it is the bar and then the bench. Yeah. I, I um, would recommend it to anyone as a fascinating career. I mean, you will never wake up and say to yourself, oh, no, another day at the office. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, hard work and it's not always as well paid as people think. Mm -hmm. And we certainly get an insight into your fascinating career in your book, Rough Justice, um, which is out now for anybody who's interested in learning more. It really is a fantastic read. And Wendy, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today and discuss some, some of your career moments and indeed your book. And best of luck with everything. Thank you very much, Sarah. 
Thanks everyone for joining me today. If you like the show, please remember to share and leave a review if you have a moment. And you can also check out our website, www.activistlawyer.com, where you will see some blog articles written by our guests and contributors, as well as some fabulous Activist Lawyer merchandise. This podcast was recorded in Granite Podcast Studio. Interested in starting up your own podcast but don't know how? Granite Podcast Studio can help. Record your podcast in our state-of-the-art studio, which is based in the heart of Newry City. Our studio has cutting-edge and user-friendly technology and can seat up to four people. We also provide an editing service for our team using your guidance and editing notes to provide you with a flawless finished product, leaving your listeners wanting more. For more information on how you can get started, visit www.granitepodcaststudio.com.